All right, maybe we can get started as people also join. Okay, sure. So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to another Gulfit uh, seminar series. Uh, today, our uh, invited uh, speaker is Dr. Mary Lou Gendron Marso Yes. If um, I spell it correctly, thank you. And uh, <laughs> she's going to talk to us. Uh, she's going to give us actually uh, an eye, a radio eye on galaxy clusters. A few words about our speaker, Dr. Uh, Mary Lou is currently an ESO fellow at the Institute of Astrophysique de Andalusia, acting as an SKA science community manager. From 2018 till 2021, she has been an ESO fellow based in Santiago, Chile, with duties also at the ALMA Observatory. Uh, previously, she has uh, done her uh, PhD at the University de Montreal from 2014 till 2018, supervised by Julie Havlacek Larondo in the XTRA Astrophysics Research Group. She's also passionate, of course, about science outreach. That's why we have her here. We are so happy to have her here with us and solving the issues of diversity in science. In general, apart from all of this, her research uh, focus is on groups and clusters, as you will see today, with, uh, and uh, checking, uh, of course, the powerful jets that are being launched by supermassive black holes, black holes or in several galaxies within the intracluster medium. Uh, also, she has observatory duties from, for the ALMA Observatory, and she serves as astronomy on duty at the ALMA Operation Support Facility. So that's enough for, uh, for, from me. Let's welcome Mary Lou, and the, the stage is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Can you see me well? So is everything all right? Yeah, we can see you. Yeah. And we can hear you. Excellent. Perfect. Uh, thank you for the invitation. Thank you for the nice introduction. Uh, feels like I've been doing many things <laughs> in the last few years. Um, so, so yeah. So today I want to. The, the title of my talk basically is uh, a radio eye on galaxy cluster, right? And this is the outline of what I want to present today. Uh, but my goal is is really to kind of uh, present you what a radio eye, a telescope, a radio telescope can discover when looking at uh, clusters of galaxies. Uh, because we've made a lot of progress uh, not so long ago on, on uh, radio facilities, their sensitivity, and we've discovered many, many things, especially, uh, well, I'm a little biased here, but it's a lot in galaxy clusters. Um, and I don't know how many of you um, are very familiar with that, but I think this is, these new observations are really important and quite spectacular as well. So um, the outline of the talk is the following. So I'm gonna spend a lot of time actually on the introduction. I want to be sure that we are all on the same page here. So what are galaxy clusters? Um, but what are galaxy clusters in my point of view when I'm looking at them with a radio telescope? Um, then I'm gonna really quickly give you an update on uh, recent advances in radio observation. Uh, so which is why we are discovering many new things right now and all of the new open questions that we have. So you're gonna see that. Uh, and then um, part of the talk also I will talk about my own science. So my own uh, results on a VLA observation of one galaxy cluster in particular, which is called the Perseus cluster, very well known uh, nearby galaxy cluster. Um, and then finally, I'm gonna, I'm gonna just quickly uh, talk as well as, as of my point of view about future of galaxy cluster studies at radio wavelengths. So what I think the future is gonna be. Um, if you wanna know more, yeah, well, we can talk, and, but also you can have a look at these papers here, and here's a list of my fabulous collaborators that I've been working on a bit uh, for the precious cluster. So let's start with this beautiful image uh, from JWST, right? The first uh, uh, released image of the J uh, James Webb Space Telescope was actually a galaxy cluster. So I guess galaxy cluster are really cool. Uh, so galaxy cluster are the largest gravitationally bound structures in the universe. They are made of thousands of galaxies. They extend on megaparsec scale, right? Uh, here you can see many of those galaxies. This is an infrared image, uh, of course. I'm not gonna be talking uh, much about the optical or the infrared side of galaxy cluster, but this is what it looks like. Um, another cluster uh, image, optical image actually of a, of a cluster here is, this is 
the famous Ferris's poster. You will see it, uh, this image a lot during my talk because I'm going to be using it as an example a lot. Uh, so you see many elliptical galaxies that are part of, um, uh, of, these, uh, of this cluster. Uh, the central uh, galaxy uh, in galaxy cluster is, is what we call BCGs, right? Brightest cluster galaxies. Uh, these are interesting uh, galaxies because they lie right in the center of galaxy cluster. They, are, they lie in this special environment. And so often they show special characteristics as well. Uh, in the case of uh, NGC 1275, which is the BCG of Perseus, uh, when you look at it in, in the optical, this is um, H alpha and N2, and you will see these large filamentary optical uh, emission line nebula. Uh, this is like one of the most uh, spectacular case, but we see this, these kind of filaments around many, many BCGs. Uh, so these are very special. Uh, Galaxy. So I've been working a little bit about that uh, with IFU, for example, like CITEL on CFHD, but I just wanted to point out that uh, I don't just do radio astronomy, uh, although I really like it, sometimes I do some optical stuff as well. Uh, but yeah, great, um, yeah, in interesting uh, characteristic around these uh, BCGs. Now, the majority of the mass of uh, a galaxy cluster is not actually the, the galaxies themselves, it's of course the black matter. But there's also an important component, which we call the intracluster medium, which is quite significant as well. So I've represented it here on this image uh, as blue, uh, just to be, uh, to be a little bit more uh, I don't know, uh, clear about that. Uh, but what is the intracluster medium? The intracluster medium is a hot diffuse plasma that fill all the cluster center. Okay, this is what I'm trying to represent on this image here. Um, it's actually really bright in the X-ray. It emits a lot of X-ray photons because it's really, really hot, right? And so when you look at the sky with an X-ray telescope, you see clusters that, as bright extended source of X-ray photons. Um, very interesting to study, but then there's like a little problem that comes with that because all of this gas is emitting actually so much X-ray photons that this gas should be cooling onto the central galaxy very quickly and so the bcg should be uh should all be like really star forming uh but this is really not what we observe bcg are usually not uh do not have a lot of uh, star formation in them so this is what uh we call in the past the cooling flow problem so we need some source of energy that will keep the gas uh hot basically that will come kind of like uh, put energy into the gas to prevent the cooling from happening so what is that source of energy? What could it be? To answer that question, we're going to have a little bit of a look on uh, the galaxies that are part of uh, galaxy clusters. So all of these large uh, elliptical galaxies, all of them have a supermassive black hole right in the center. A subset of these galaxies are what we call active galaxies, means that they have an accreting black hole. And some of these active galaxies uh, will actually accelerate uh, relativistic electrons. Uh, and in magnetic field, these jets here will produce uh, synchrotron emission. Okay? And given the strength of the magnetic field, given the energy, the precise energy of these electrons, you will have synchrotron emission at around one gigahertz. So in radio wavelength. Okay? So during this whole talk, I'm going to be only focusing on synchrotron emission. So when I talk about, I'm not going to be talking about lines, I'm going to be talking about continuum synchrotron emission. Uh, we can have a look a little bit more uh, uh, on the synchrotron emission, what is, what is the, the spectrum of that. For well, the spectrum is going to be the combination of the emission of each individual, individual electrons inside those jets, right? In sense. Now, if you have a power law distribution in energy of these electrons, you will also get the power law um, spectrum for synchrotron emission. And this indices here, the slope of this uh, of the spectrum, alpha, oops, is gonna be, <laughs> uh, is gonna be directly related to uh, the energy distribution uh, of the electrons, okay? So what I mean here is that if you have a very energetic uh, population of electrons that just been accelerated by the supermassive black hole, you will have a more flat spectrum that emits two higher frequencies. But if you have a less energetic population of electrons, uh, electrons that are more tired, let's say, that have less energy, then you will get a steeper spectrum. And then you have most of the emission at low radio frequencies. Okay? 
this is going to be important for the, for the rest of the talk. Then what does this, these jets look like when we look at them with radio telescopes? So these are two examples. Um, I put them uh, with the radio jets of, of uh, the Perseus cluster, the central galaxy in the Perseus cluster. Not very impressive, uh, but there's other, other cases that we've seen before probably that are really impressive um, radio jets. And these jets are really big, okay? They extend in many cases beyond the whole galaxy. And what is, the, what is there beyond the whole galaxy? There is the intracoastal medium that I was telling you about, which is really not as smooth and um, uniform as I was uh, showing before. Actually, when you look at them with, uh, for example, Chandra, that in those cases, you see lots of uh, interaction with the radio jets, okay? And this, this is what we call the famous AGM mechanical feedback. So these jets, um, inflate bubbles inside the intracluster medium and prevent uh, the cooling from happening. So this is the source of energy that um, prevent the cooling from happening, okay? Which is quite remarkable, right? When you think about it, the supermassive black hole inside those galaxies, uh, in terms of scale, is really, really small compared to the whole cluster. Uh, and still, it's, it seems to be ruling the entire uh, cluster dynamic. Um, now, we're going to de-zoom a little bit out of uh, the central part of the, of the cluster. So this is, again, versus a beautiful image. Uh, we were kind of looking at the central part here with the central galaxy, and you see it was only five, OK? But there's, so this is an active galaxy, but there's other active galaxies with radio jets inside uh, the first cluster. So what happened? Uh, what does these radio jets look like when you're not in the center and doing all the aging people? So we're going to have a kind of a historic tour of that. And uh, I'm going to start by showing this image that I really like. Uh, it's, I think, as far as I know, this is like the oldest um, image of the Perseus cluster at radio wavelength. At least this is what I found. Uh, it was published more than 50 years ago, okay? And you can see the radio jets uh, not really resolved here of the central galaxy. And then there is these two really interesting radio sources uh, with head tail uh, morphologies. This is how they describe it. Uh, it was taken with uh, this uh, uh, telescope here in Cambridge, the one mile telescope. Um, in this paper, they, uh, they were quite you know, uh, curious about this kind of shape here. And it be, they suggest that perhaps the shape is because there is some sort of wind, right, from the central galaxy that kind of push on them and create this head tail shape. This was an idea. Uh, but then what happened is that later there was better observation, a deeper observation of the first cluster. And then in, on, on top of these two here, they found another one, again, a head tail morphology, but pointing in the wrong direction. Right, if it's not uh, aligned like the two others, it's pointing on this side here. Uh, as you can see, the, the little contour here, it's quite small. So this is CR15, and it completely ruled out the previous idea. Uh, so the uh, alignment or approximate alignment that we uh, that these people were observing before was probably just a coincidence. And um, and so they propose a new explanation, which can you can read here. Uh, which I took directly from the paper, and I think it's pretty funny how they, they describe it. Uh, so they propose a simpler explanation, namely that the extended sources are radio galaxies in their own right, okay? uh, but the direction and form of the radio pair also just motion of a radio galaxy resisted through a gaseous medium. Okay. Interesting. So these radio galaxies are going through something, and that's why we see these hyper shapes. But what are they going through? Well, the intact cluster medium, of course. And um, while they were observing these radio galaxies for the, first, for the first time, at the same time, they were also carrying the first extra observation of galaxy clusters. And they were discovering that, uh, well, they were discovering the intracluster medium, basically, uh, as you can see in this, uh, in this image uh, for the first cluster. Um, so this uh, medium that they were observing for the first time in X-ray is uh, the gaseous medium in which these galaxies are going through. Then there was more and more radio observation of galaxies with very strange morphology. Morphology. So we went from the head tail to maybe 
like uh, more like bent jet radio galaxies, right? Uh, that are less uh, bent together. So what's our current or the interpretation of these, uh, like the general, I will use the, the, the general term of bent jet radio galaxies here. Uh, but what's our current or the interpretation of these galaxies? Uh, well, you have an active galaxies, uh, an active galaxy with radio jets and it's going through the intracluster medium. And so what happened is that, as you can see in the simulation, the jets are gonna be bent uh, by the rapid pressure and it's gonna form uh, this kind of shape here. Um, the higher the velocity uh, between the galaxy and the intracluster medium, okay, because the intracluster medium can also move. Maybe the galaxy is not moving that much, but maybe the ICM is also moving. So the higher this velocity, the higher the run pressure and the more bent uh, the jets are gonna be. Okay? This is what we think is happening. Uh, one of the prototypes of these bent jet radio galaxy is NGC 465, which you may recognize uh, from textbooks actually, uh, in the Perseus cluster. Uh, and you can see how, you know, it really looks like very well at this uh, simulation. Um, nowadays, we use this uh, kind of uh, classification scheme um, to try to understand them better. So depending on the opening angle that we observe, uh, the projecting opening angle that we observe, we're gonna distinguish them more or less between wide angle tail, narrow angle tail, and head tail. So if we don't really see, distinguish, resolve the jets, we're gonna call it the head tail. Um, this has been very useful, uh, I think, uh, but nowadays it's becoming, uh, I think, very challenging to classify them according to this, uh, these three categories. Just looking at, again, just the, really the prototype of, thing, of this bench of the galaxy. When you look at it, you might say, okay, this is a, looks like a narrow angle tail, right? But what if you have different kind of observations that are not very deep, but very high resolution, right? so that you just see the brightest part, then it kind of look more like a white angle tail, you know? And what if, like back in the days, they didn't have resolution at all, then you don't resolve these jets and then it's a head tail. Okay, so just this one uh, prototype, uh, then jet the it becomes very difficult to classify it depending on the type of observation. And finally, um, one more thing I want to say about uh, in my introduction is actually uh, the fact that, you know, I've been talking about radio emission uh, in jets, right? In central galaxies, in non-central galaxies, but there's actually diffuse radio emission everywhere in galaxy clusters, okay? Uh, and so if you have the proper resolution, this is what you see in the versus cluster. This is a VLA observation. All the pink here is radio observation, the synchrotron region. And all of this is not directly associated with any radio galaxy, okay? Uh, this is what we see in Perseus, but things get even more crazy and dramatic in, for example, merging clusters where there's more activity, you can start to see like giant radio halo or relics like this here. Okay, this is one megaparsec. So these sources of radio emission are really, really big. And again, this is all synchrotron emission. So you need two things, you need mag magnetic fields and relativistic electrons, right? Like that. Um, so there's a little problem here because this source, for example, is really far from the central galaxy, right? So how come you can see radio emission? How come the, the, the electron is still relativistic at these kind of distances? Um, the thing is that as these electrons are no longer accelerated by anything, they're just diffusing and losing energy through radiative losses, uh, the spectra here will change and it will emit at lower, lower, lower radio frequencies. Um, and normally we should not be able to see uh, this kind of radio emission at such large distances. So you need some source of reacceleration in here uh, to explain, you know, a relic, for example, or just like this uh, halo, for example. Now there's there's starting to be uh, answers to that question: What is that source of reacceleration? And it uh, it is all linked to the fact that galaxy clusters are not that quiet. Okay, even Perseus is not super quiet. Uh, there is this concept of stormy weather that I really like in galaxy clusters. Uh, you know, internally, there's this all this agent feedback happening. Externally, there is this galaxy falling, they're merging with groups and clusters of galaxies. So lots of things happening. And all of this will disturb the intracluster medium. Okay? 
So as I said, it, it won't be like this smooth distribution. It will be full of structures. This is what we resolve with the with X-ray telescope. Um, and so we can do simulation of that. Not me, but my collaborators can do that. For example, this point here. Uh, so this is the projected uh, X-ray surface brightness gradient. So basically what a, let's say, our X-ray telescope would see. So it's the intracluster medium, okay? And this is uh, shown uh, uh, actually a cluster merging with a subcluster. And this is five giga years, giga years sorry, after the merger. So you can already see that there's a lot of perturbation because the ICM will kind of start to move like this. So this is sloshing motion uh, because of the gravitational perturbation from the, the nearby cluster coming back. So we'll develop these kind of spiraling cold fronts that we see many uh, in many, many uh, galaxy clusters, including in person. Okay. So now what's going to happen in this simulation that is quite uh, unique, I would say, is that on top of all of these uh, sloshing happening, uh, this simulation also includes the launch of, uh, of jets from the central galaxy. Okay. So this is what we see here. So, um, bubbles that are being created, but then the sloshing continue and all of this kind of get mixed. Um, so what's uh, even more interesting uh, is the addition of uh, like tracer of electrons, okay? So imagine you have these jets here launch, what's gonna happen with these electrons inside those jets? Where are they gonna go? So this is what you're gonna see on that panel here. So you see the jets at the beginning, but very quickly, these jets, this, this cavities are completely, uh, you know, disrupted and they mix with the intracluster medium. And all of these electrons get diffused and fill uh, eventually the cluster center completely. So that you end up with something that kind of looks like a halo in a relic, like I was showing you before, right? So there's compelling evidence that ICM motions like this are uh, able to reaccelerate uh, particles uh, and create these diffuse radio components that we're observing in galaxy cluster more and more. But this conception is really something uh, quite new. Okay, um, this is a bit of a summary of, of what I, I just said. I'm gonna uh, skip that and, and, and go directly to the to the next part. Uh, that is going to be also very quick. But basically, I wanted to give you. Uh, you know, I mentioned that we've made a lot of progress um, on radio observation in general, but especially in the galaxy cluster. And this is due to many things, but I would say like three main things. First of all, we have more uh, facilities that are sensitive at low radio frequencies, such as low power and the um, And given the shape, you know, of the spectrum of these electrons, if you want to look, you know, to find these electrons that are a little bit tired, if used everywhere at the cluster, we want to look at very low radio frequencies below one gigahertz. So we have more and more facilities that are sensitive at these um, at these frequencies. We have increased as well uh, the bandwidth of the receiver in, on those uh, facilities like VLA, GMIT, um, and we've improved as well. There's many people uh, working on improving the imaging algorithm. Okay, and uh, and Probably you guys know <laughs> better about all of this um, than me, but there's been a lot of progress, right? So what have we found with all of these inside galaxy clusters? Well, I can tell you things got really crazy, okay? Uh, and this is just a few selection of things that, uh, I don't know, kind of, um, yeah, kind of made me like, what, <laughs> what is that? <laughs> so we have, for example, relics, right? So these two, two of the most, Probably famous relics, uh, the sausage and the toothbrush, excellent names. We can see many filaments inside them. Uh, inside galaxy cluster like Abel 2256, we have this giant patch of radio emission full of filaments again, unclear what it is. You have this very thin uh, line here, I would say. This is a probably a head tail, so you cannot distinguish the two jets, but this thing is really long. See? This is 500 kiloparsecs. So you have two jets that are bent backward and stay collimated on all of this distance. This is a bit strange. You have the same thing here in that other uh, uh, galaxy cluster, or this one here, uh, which is not as thin, but it has like this weird 
periodic um, uh, bright patches inside the, on, on, on this tail. Uh, you might think that galaxy groups are a little bit uh, more quiet, but no, <laughs> apparently not. You have things like this, this in pink here, you see all the radiation doing really crazy filaments everywhere. Um, same thing in that other cluster here, and you have radio phoenix, uh, which are just like patches of radio plasma somewhere inside the galaxy cluster, which are somehow re-energized by the ICM, uh, but unrelated to any radio gas. So weird stuff, right? Uh, this is the, the world of galaxy cluster at radio radio. It's quite crazy. Um, so we have many new questions, right? First of all, how do we classify these sources? Um, they're very different. Uh, we have these names, you know, relics, halos, moving halos, um, the bench of video galaxies. Uh, it be it's becoming more and more difficult to classify them into those categories. What are their origin? How exactly does the acceleration process work? Uh, what is the link between a cluster and a radio source property? Uh, what is the distribution and strength of magnetic fields across clusters? Okay, so these are a few questions that uh, for me are quite important. Okay, so now we're gonna talk a little bit more about one particular example, okay? Uh, which is of course the Fisher cluster. Uh, this is uh, one image that I, I think I've showed you that before. Um, so just a little bit of an introduction on this particular gas cluster. It's very nearby, okay, 17 megaparsec away. It's actually the X-ray brightest cluster in the sky. So that's why it's so well known, so well studied. Okay? You see a lot of details uh, inside these uh, this nearby example. So you see, for example, the jets inflate in cavities here, and then there's an older pair of, of, of cavities that have been like inflated in the past and like floating away. And you have also this kind of spiral um, structure of sloshing inside the the ICM. So many, many details that we can see, okay? Um, I've been working myself on uh, BLA observation, as I said, of this uh, particular cluster. So in two different bands, uh, P-band at around 350 megahertz and L-band 1.5 gigahertz. Um, these data uh, were taken after the extended very large array project, uh, replacing the receiver so that uh, the observation is much better than in the past. Right. I worked myself more on the P-band while my colleagues were work more on the L-band observation. And um, well, this looks like, like an easy thing, you know, the early observation of one cluster, but it's actually really challenging to observe, uh, to make images of uh, versus at radio work lane because it's really, really bright, okay? So the central AGN inside the, the cluster is 384, which you may know because you may be using it as a calibrator really happy for you, but for me, it's kind of a nightmare because I want to see all the faint emission right next to this really bright source. But with the thought of uh, patients, we were able to, to reach really high level of range. And, uh, and this is three of our uh, resulting maps. So these are two at uh, E band 350 megahertz and this one L band 1.5 gigahertz, okay? Uh, so what do we see uh, in those maps? I'm just going to guide you a little bit through, uh, through this image. Um, the jets here are barely seen okay, in the central. Uh, this is a really, really bright source. Uh, then you have this mini halo, like a, it's a halo for small basically, uh, in the cluster center that fill all the cluster center. And then you have all of these other um, radio galaxies that are uh, benched radio galaxies. Uh, basically that are really interesting. So I'm going to present you uh, some key results that we have done on all of these uh, sources, okay? But very rapidly. First of all, the, the mini halo mission. Uh, this is what we found. And, um, and it was quite surprising how much details uh, we saw in this, in this mini halo mission. We know more or less uh, maybe 30, 40 mini halos. Uh, and all of them uh, they kind of look like more like a blob of radiation in the center of the axis cluster. But this one is like the most nearby mini halo that we know. So we can uh, probably, that is why we can see so many details in it, right? It's not uniform at all. There's like edges and, and, and spur of emission everywhere. 
So we were quite surprised to see that. And we think that this may be not you know, the special case. Maybe all new neighbors are more like that. Um, moving on to the to the Benjet with the galaxies. Um, this is the, the famous NGC 1265 um, at, uh, at P band. So we can see here at higher resolution and at lower resolution that we observe. Lots of beautiful filaments, right, in this part of the tail that was uh, quite well known. Uh, one thing that is less known about NGC 1265 is that there's actually this extension of the tail when you look at lower resolution. Uh, that is very strange, it kind of bend on almost like a full circle. Uh, and for the first time, we also saw like filaments inside that part of the tail. Um, this galaxy is actually a really good example of, um, you know, trying to interpret what, what this tail is doing exactly. Um, I mean, we cannot um, explain my morphology just based on the whole galaxy motion inside the cluster and some strange projection effect, right? Uh, I think it's pretty clear that it requires some level of interaction uh, between this radio plasma and the cluster media. How exactly? Unclear, uh, but this has uh, it has been suggested before that this galaxy may be passed through um, a shock wave inside this uh, inside the intracluster medium, and it may have reaccelerated the plasma to make uh, that extension of it. That's uh, one possible idea, but it's quite complex. Even though, yeah, it, it's the prototype of this venture uh, to the galaxy. Uh, another interesting thing, uh, an interesting case is uh, IC310 and other bench video galaxies. Actually, it was these two were discovered over like 50 years ago. Um, it looked like that in my first image uh, ever that I made of the Persis cluster. Then, if you uh, go to slightly higher resolution, uh, we start to see this here. There's like a little gap. And we see this uh, also in C band, for example, with the really. Uh, so it seems like to be a, a real feature, um, and so for me, it, it was, I was really happy, right, because I was like, this is a head tail radio galaxy. If you go to higher resolution, you see the jets for the first time, so this is, this is great. Um, although, when I started to research about IC310, I found out that there's this whole community of people that study IC310 in the gamma rays because it emits a lot of very high energy emission. Okay, you can see here um, from Fermi. So this is the, the brightest cluster galaxy, and this is IC310. Uh, and so for these people, IC310 is a blazon. Okay, so it has normal radio jets that are not bent, and one of them is pointing towards us so that we can see all this gamma rays, right? Uh, so is it a blazon? Is it a bent jet radio galaxy? It was pretty confusing um, and still is a little bit. Uh, but we came up with one idea, one possible interpretation that kind of agree with both. Uh, and, and it comes down to the fact that you know this gap here that we see is really small, right? The radius of curvature is extremely small. And we think that it has to be due to projection effects. So that probably it looks more like a normal, like a Benjet for the galaxy, but we're kind of seeing. Uh, observing it with this line of sight so that the jets, instead of being like this, are kind of more like this, right? They are uh, more edge on. In this way, uh, with this line of sight, we would also receive the gamma rays anyway. So this, these gamma rays won't, would not be, uh, I mean, they're coming very close uh, from the supermassive black hole. So we don't think that they would follow this bending, right? They would be pointing towards us. So um, we think that blazar and bedjet radio galaxy may actually not be mutually exclusive phenomena. And this may be uh, the first example of that. Is there other examples of that? We don't know. Uh, probably we will be looking for that in the future. Uh, one last example, which I think is the most uh, spectacular one, is uh, this galaxy, NGC 1272, uh, which is this uh, bright, uh, elliptical galaxy very near, uh, very close to the brightest cluster galaxy. Okay? Uh, in my first observation um, in the P band, this is all what I could see. Uh, so it looks like a wide angle tail. It uh, has this like boom line kind of shape here. Um, it was known before, it was identified before as a wide angle tail. And that's about it, right? Uh, but it's very close to the mini halo emission. It's 
not connected, it's not inside, but it's so, it's really, really close. Um, but we cannot tell much more from that observation. And to go to higher resolution, to try to dissolve a little bit more of that, we need to go uh, to Elden, to higher frequency. This is what my colleagues did, and this is what we saw. And I was pretty shocked the first time I saw that. So actually, all of this part here, which we always thought was a new hill, uh, is actually something that looks like an extension of the tail of these benches, right? So you see the bend jets here, you see them here, but now you have this like winding channel of emission uh, in only one side. And then it turns out to be like an eddy-like structure and then like more diffuse lobes, right? Uh, very complex uh, structures that we see here. And, um, and this was an interesting result to see that bend jet in the galaxy inside the universe, right? Uh, like this here. Uh, because it's very likely that the electrons, you know, uh, accelerated by this galaxy um, are responsible for part of the mini halo. Uh, and, and this has been seen in other cases, like, for example, here you have a mini halo mission uh, and then um, uh, like a sort of an echo here, very near. Um, and also, uh, it has been seen, for example, in the case of a relic here uh, with an other active galaxy very nearby. Okay, so these links between non-central active gal radio galaxies and diffuse uh, radio emission is, is something that we find more and more. Okay, so the possibility that benjet radio galaxies could contribute to diffuse radio conformity cluster, it, maybe it's something um, quite general, actually. Um, now, to put everything in context, I made this composite image uh, with the two, you know, the central galaxy, this big elliptical galaxy, and then I just kept the, the radio uh, uh, tail of that of that galaxy. We tried to interpret the morphology that we were seeing, but we're not sure exactly uh, what's you know what's the the most likely case. Okay, so maybe it's several of those things. Um, one thing that was a bit strange: the fact that these bend jets are kind of uh, like in front of the rest of the tail. And we think that maybe this is projection effect. Um, so that we are seeing, we're capturing this galaxy as it is turning around on its orbit through a cluster, right? So because often you can find like um, infalling benjet radio galaxies and uh, outgoing benjet radio galaxies. So maybe this is like an in-between case. And, um, and so that would explain why the benjets are kind of projected in front of the rest of the day. Um, this is perhaps an idea. Uh, if I add on top of this quite complex image, but if I add uh, the general observation of the process cluster uh, to scale, you will see that there's an interesting feature that, that falls right here. Uh, so this cold front here, so this is um, the spiraling cold front due to the sloshing of the gas inside process. And this uh, falls like more or less exactly in between the more collimated part of that tail and the more diffuse part. Right? Um, so perhaps it has some um, impact, you know, on, on the shape of, uh, of that radio galaxy. Maybe uh, this radio galaxy passed through the gold vessel from make something a little bit different. Um, so that's another idea. And finally, uh, one thing that I think uh, many uh, of us, when we saw this image, uh, noticed is the similarities uh, between this part here and, uh, and a carbon vortex tree. So carbon vortex trees are characterized by this repetition of swirling vortices that we observe in nature on various scales. We have two images here that show that. Uh, but these kind of vortices appear uh, only in very particular condition in terms of viscosity of the medium. Okay? Um, so uh, you cannot that have this kind of uh, vortices in any condition. Uh, and the idea here is that the electrons coming from that galaxy are kind of following the wave of the galaxy inside the ICM um, and are creating uh, this tail of emission with things that looks like a common chemistry. So perhaps uh, with this kind of observation, we could be uh, you know, able to constrain uh, or help to put constraint on the transport coefficient of the intracluster medium, which is something that we don't know well. We cannot really constrain that with X-ray observation. It's very difficult. 
but you know it's pretty clear that's not the laminar flow that we're observing uh maybe it's a common vortex stream maybe it's a turbulent flow uh, it's, it's it's a bit hard to estimate but it's interesting to, to point out that um okay so these are more or less a, this is more or less a, a, a a summary of all the things I've said um, about these, you know, these new results that we have in, in only one, you know, galaxy cluster, this with this beautiful uh, VLA observation. And there's actually more observation that I'm working on. Uh, and who knows what we're going to find, right? So Persis is really an amazing laboratory to study um, those sources. And what about the future? Uh, well, I think the future of uh, Cluster studies at radio wavelength is going to be really interesting uh, with, for example, the coming of SKO, right? The largest radio telescope on Earth, uh, tens of hundreds of thousands of antennas uh, that would reach an incredible sensitivity. And um, you can look at a, a little bit at these papers, but basically we're going to find many more sources, of course. Uh, something like a million uh, band jet free galaxies thousands of mini, of mini halos and halos and relics. Um, it's going to be quite um, quite interesting to see that. Then there is LOFAR, for example, with this uh, interesting survey, which is called LOS, uh, that will go to very low digit frequency, okay, like 50 megahertz, uh, again, to try to capture these electrons that um, are emitting only at these kind of frequencies because they are not very energetic and diffuse all uh, everywhere in, in, in galaxy clusters. So who knows what we're going to find in that one. Um, this is a kind of a, just to show you that sensitivity uh, frequency plot. You have low power low here, you have SK, NGBL. So uh, probably that in the future, you know, we're going to have a very good sensitivity at all in all of these, uh, in all of this frequency range. And we're going to find, you know, orders of magnitude more so. So it's a bit scary. You know? <laughs> I mean, we're already a little bit struggling to classify them. And now, uh, yeah, I don't know what we're going to do. <laughs> and actually, I mean, if you look at the literature, there's actually people working on that. Um, you know, I think one of the important things that we need to do is to try to change our way we classify these sources. And um, there was this, uh, my collaborator here that uh, has this cool suggestion of attributing ash bags to sources um, instead of putting them into boxes. Um, so more or less attributing the keywords to sources that would evolve um, depending on surveys and things like that. But it was a cool idea. Uh, machine learning would be uh, our best friends prob probably in all of that. Uh, there's already lots of work in that direction and this is good. I think we're going to really need that. Um, simulations, uh, this is the paper of the simulation that I showed you. Uh, we're going to need that to compare to observation, uh, try to de detangle, you know, the projection of these kind of things. And um, also polarization measurement, I think it's going to be something more and more possible and important to, to derive the strength and structure of the nucleus. So with all of that, I mean, it's, it's a bit scary, but it's mostly uh, pretty exciting. Um, so, yeah, as I said, we are kind of seeing, you know, with these new radio observations, uh, that galaxy clusters are really, uh, really complex, right? I like this idea that one day perhaps we can use bench of galaxies as tracer of the cluster weather, right? because they are inside this ICN, perhaps we can really use them to understand that better. And all of these efforts are, are paving the way for sure for the future radio facilities, such as SKO and NGBO. So uh, I'm going to conclude on that, but uh, feel free to, to contact me if you got inspired by this observation, if you want to, um, if you have ideas on how to understand them. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mary Lou. That was great. Uh, thank you for the wealth of uh, uh, information and explaining all this very uh, interesting and still very uh, not well known uh, features in the ICM, which is really interesting and exciting. I also agree. And uh, please, anyone who would like uh, to ask any question, feel free uh, to open the mic or just uh, write it up and I will say it. 
And uh, if there are any questions, please uh, go ahead. Maybe I can kick off and maybe until people warm up or they think of uh, something that they want to ask. Uh, so, uh, for example, let me just ask for the simulations from Zuhon et al. Uh, is there a specific um, a mass ratio from the perturber that this can actually work or uh, any kind of uh, minor merging or sloshing can work and contribute to the, let's say, uh, uh, perturbance of the ICM? Mm. Yeah, so for example, this one uh, it has a mass ratio of five, right? Um, five. Yeah. Um, I don't, I don't, I don't know if if he has tested like many probably has a different uh, mass ratio, but um, yeah, I don't know in, in his paper exactly what uh, what he tests. I guess if you increase the mass ratio, then everything gets more picture. Uh, this gets you know this sloshing is even more pronounced and everything. Even more uh, but I, Yeah, yeah, but I think what is I mean it, yeah it really depends. You have you have. Two cases, right? You have like a really strong merging systems, um, but you also have you know things a little bit more quiet, like the versus cluster. Uh, weird, but you still have sloshing, and apparently this is still. It looks like it is enough to produce to produce new behaviors. For example, he has another paper um, focusing on that that you know produce something that really looks like uh, like the first two states. So. Uh, yeah, we need I, I, I we need to, to look at the paper exactly because I don't remember if it's how much uh, different parameters it is. No, no, absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Any questions from the audience, please? Yes, Paul Fallon, please. Uh, you may please open your mic and go ahead. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you. I think thanks for a really interesting talk. Just wanted to ask around the, the bending of the jets you mentioned due to the RAM pressure and due to cold fronts. Any comments that you can make around uh, magnetic fields impacting the bending of jets or wh what sort of drives the overall mechanism or how much is actually known about exactly how the, the jets or major effects causing the, the jets to bend? Mm, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, oops, I'm sorry. Out. Let me let me share again. Sorry. Looks like my keynote like decided to stop to work. Um. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so, so what is known about the the magnetic fields inside those fan jets? I don't, I don't. I mean, what we we think is happening really is that uh, it's the ramp pressure from the intracluster medium that um, that will curve that would curve these jets. Um, there is, as I, I showed, like one video of simulation of that. So I, I'm not a simulation person, so I don't know exactly how they if they prove magnetic fields in those simulation and how they deal with that and what happened with it. Uh, but it's a it's a it's an important question, right? Because we have you know uh, tails with really strange morphologies, and so I don't know uh, how the the magnetic fields like get influenced by this this bending. Uh, but I think the answer for that it has to be coming from from simulation, I guess. Um, but there's not a lot of work uh, right now on that. There has there's a few people working on that, but uh, I would really like you know <laughs> that there is more uh, to compare with uh, what we are finding right now. But uh, I cannot really tell more than that, unfortunately. Um, well, just just curious because it, it seems like the whatever is causing the jets to bend is having a dramatic effect. And it, it looks different in, different in so many cases. It'd be interesting just to see how much work is done on it and how much work is, and, or how much is actually understood about what causes the, the jets to bend. So yeah, yeah. It, 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 I find it really interesting. Yeah, 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 I don't know. Yeah. Yes. Okay. 
Great, thanks. Okay, Th many thanks uh, for this question. Well, yes, there is still under investigation all of that, of course. Uh, we have a okay, comment from Benjamin Hugo saying uh, uh, very, uh, sorry, one second. Uh, thank you, very cool talk and overview. Many thanks, mm -hmm. Benjamin, for your comment. Uh, are there any questions before we thank our speaker? No? Okay. Great. So uh, once again, yes, uh, many thanks, uh, Mary Lou, for uh, this very interesting talk. And we really thank you for this. And uh, Thank you so much for the invitation. It was 